Hello. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Good. So oh. finally, at least one vaccine is up, and hopefully more soon, and hopefully some good news and things getting settled down. So with COVID, yeah. Vaccine is up, and hopefully more soon. It's and a good one. Hopefully some good news and things uh, so, getting settled down. So, can you hear me? Hello, Miss. Hello. Uh, hi. It looks like her may have some technical issues. He should be back soon. Everything okay? I cannot hear you. You mute. My uh, other laptop was you. still now. Hello. Your volume. Check your volume. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So no, my uh, other system was oh. on the when the live went. YouTube oh. was making a lot of noise. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome back, everyone. Today we are having a great session with uh, Jill's. Uh, and she is one of the leading award-winning photographer from South Africa. Yeah. We are excited to yeah, that, that gain too. knowledge from her, to know about her experience shooting in South African wildlife. wildlife. With that kind of experience, with that kind of bio, uh, you know, every word will yes. be yes. Like, a, like a jump to up. So we'll have a lot to learn from her. her yeah so let's uh, start with the introduction as always and yeah. then we'll invite our today's yeah. guest postrides is a collective collaboration of a group of dedicated nature lovers to bring humans closer to nature through the medium of photography and art we have started this organization six years ago with our wildlife photography workshops to different locations and then three other verticals has been added the magazine events and education our latest venture is this weekly webinars uh, to introduce you with fabulous photographers from across the world and live photography reviews and exhibitions hostels has two bi-monthly e-magazines We have done one international wildlife festival. We also conducted 60 plus international workshops and lectures. Exhibition. We have done 24 photography exhibitions. We have a collective social media followers of 1.5 million plus. We have also planted 40,000 plus saplings across the world. We have more than 200 plus international contributors who support us with their uh, articles, photographs, and videos. We published two coffee table books. The first book is based on 101 big cats from across the world. And the second one is based on the species from Arabian Peninsula. And the book is called The Arabian Trails. This is our so far journey, and we would like to thank our trusted partners, Nikon, Snap Coaches, and Out of the Box. Now, we welcome our chief guest, Jill Smithby. Hi, Jill. Hello. Thank, thank you, you for inviting me. It's great to be here. It, pleasure is all ours and all all the audience. So we are really honored for accepting. You know, uh, we know you are busy. Uh, Abbas has kind of spoke about your schedule. So thank you so much for giving us some time to share your experience. Only a pleasure. Thank you. So I think yeah, uh, here is Jill, and uh, she's going to take us through her journey as a photographer 
and her fabulous images. The stage okay. is all yours. Thank you. We get to try and share screen. Just bear with me. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're in Southern Africa. We're going to take photographs. Why? Because it's a wonderful hobby, profession, pastime, anything to share with the wild animals. And that is Africa. But I don't live in the whole of Africa, although some people sometimes think that South Africa is close to Egypt. It's a long way away. So we're going today to Southern Africa, the bottom tip of Africa. In fact, I should probably tell you that we're only going to do part of Southern Africa because it's so large that you cannot, in a short time, visit everywhere. And once you've been here once, you want to come back. So I live in Port Elizabeth, which is down on the southern coast, halfway between Cape Town and Durban. And the places we're going to visit today are the one closest to me, only a 45-minute drive away, Addo Elephant Park. Then up north of Cape Town to Lambert's Bay, up to the Khalakhari, and up to Etosha. So let's find out what Addo has to offer. Now here I am, and I get my car, and 45 minutes later, I can be in the Addo Elephant Park. We were on lockdown or are on lockdown, and about a month ago, they restrict, they lessen the restrictions slightly to allow us to go for day drives within our own province. Fortunately, Addo is close enough, so therefore, it was the obvious place to go to. A little bit of history. It was established in, in 1931. In the, sort of the 10 years before that, the elephants were causing havoc with the farmers. They were eating their crops and destroying their water. So the powers that be employed a major Pretorius to shoot the elephants. And in two years, he shot 200 elephants. Fortunately, people got wise to it. And when there were only 11 left, the Arrow Elephant Park was established. 2,000 hectares in size. Today, it is 170,000 hectares. Now, I have no idea how big that is, so I looked it up, I googled it, and that tells me it's 1,700 square kilometers, or 656 square miles, or if you're a rugby fan, 170,000 rugby fields. Where we're going, though, is not through the whole Arrow. Arrow, which started out near the Arrow in a small part, has developed tremendously up into the mountain, down to the coast, and even to two islands in the ocean, which makes it home to the Big Seven. To your normal Big Five have been added the Great White Shark and the Southern Right Whale. I'm not going into them today. I'm just going to take you to the wonderful little place at Arrow, Arrow Elephant Park. So therefore, we're concentrating on the elephants. You do get all sorts of other creatures, but uh, elephants are most important. Now, I just put this little picture in because I don't want you to think that Africa and South Africa is only lots of animals and wide open spaces. We do have lots of cities and harbors and all sorts of normal things but we are very very fortunate to have the oasis of Addo and other places 
And the beauty of Arrow is you can drive yourself there. You don't have to, but you can. And the elephants are very friendly and come nice and close to you. That background that you're seeing there is not the rough terrain. It's actually the skin of an elephant, just to show you how close up they do come. They are very protective of their young, and therefore you'll often see them on the shadow side of a mother. Unfortunately, this is a problem photographically. You'd rather have them in the sunlight. And in the previous picture, they did come in, the loin did come in the sunlight, but more often than not, you have to be patient, which actually is very easy because there's nothing more wonderful than sitting in the wild and just watching and experiencing what the animals do. Sometimes you should actually put your camera down and not try and take the photograph because you are so concentrated in on looking for that perfect shot that you actually miss so much more of what's going on around you. And that's what's going on around me. The whole wood hole right there, right close to me. And you can just see lots and lots of animals, very friendly, coming down to drink. Sorry, my screen has just froze. Any suggestions, anyone? Uh, uh, you just need to press on the uh, arrow. I know, but it's not working. It's frozen. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Hermi, can you help? I, I think we need to uh, share it again, maybe. No, so stop sharing. Yeah, and share it again. Share it again, please. Okay. Sorry about that. We'll try and share again. Yeah. No I'm going to just go to the next picture and then... We all come across this internet issues. Yeah. Yes. Okay, we have come yeah, back. To, yeah, that's that's the waterhole. Sorry. Yeah, it is right. Good. Okay. Good. Okay. And that's how close the elephants come to the cars. Mm -hmm. They are very friendly, and you are parked there at the waterhole to photograph, and you can see they walk in amongst you. They have been to the water. They're nice and wet, and as I say friendly, no need to be scared of them at all. Now that is the same place, same waterhole, and the elephant's just walking very close. For those of you who are interested, it's shot on a 28 to 300 zoom lens at 65 mil. So a lens is almost a necessity because then you can, can get a shot like that, or same lens, same energy two mil. So you can imagine just how very close they are. And here I've zoomed into 300 mil. So for Edo, while you do use, you can use the long lens because action does happen further away. If you go and sit at the waterhole and just wait, all sorts of things do happen. 
and the elephants will come in their herds down to the water. Now, I don't know if you noticed in the previous picture, I'll go back to it, this elephant doesn't have tusks. And if you look here, the one lead does not have tusks. The little guy next to him has a very tiny tusk, and a few down in the herd also have tusks. The reason for this is that the Addo elephant females don't have tusks, except for one or two. And they think it's to do with genetic inbreeding and not enough. There are all sorts of uh, reasons why not, but this is something peculiar to Addo. But there we have two males because they both have tusks, muddy tusks, muddy faces. They're not particularly fighting because they use their trunks to greet, rather like we use our hands. They're using their trunks and there's no aggression there whatsoever. And here we have two females talking to each other, using their trunks to rub each other. And there we have the youngsters in the shade of mum, two different ages, but all being protected by their mothers. In this instance, uh, this was taken a month ago when I went to Arrow. First time out was great to be able. But because it's winter here, the elephants don't come out so early and they don't listen to the photography books that say you must put off early or late to get the best light. For nature, you actually have to photograph whenever the action happens. So I chose to photograph this against the light because then you can capture some of the emotions, some of the mood, and some of the shadows and things. Just go and see what happens. And then this is what happened. This little guy was knocked over, knocked onto his back by some of the big elephants running around. And elephants are wonderful creatures. They are so thoughtful, so helpful. And already you can see the smaller one going in and going in closer. That's not aggression. That's to go and help the baby. And it's my favorite photograph. Unfortunately, it's not a good photograph because of all the dark and dust in there. But can you see, and I'm on it, do you see those three fingers that are around the babies, around the baby? That is three elephant trunks. Three elephants have come to lift it back onto its feet to make sure it is all right. And I think that's just absolutely amazing what the parents will do to look after their children. So that trunk is an amazing uh, instrument. It's got some 20,000 or more muscles, which allow it to do all sorts of things. I'm curled up exactly like this, helping the babies, putting the mud in the water, you use it to drink, and giving a baby a shower. When the babies are young, their trunks are very unwieldy. They can walk, but they can't use their trunk properly. And to start off with, they won't drink with their trunk, they'll just flop it around. And it's so cute and small, and that little guy just looks so adorable in the mud. He's having fun. He's not drowning or anything. Mum is right there looking after him, ready to pull him out, because when he gets out, it is quite muddy and slippery, quite difficult to get out. But there you are, you see, they can have these amazing pink colors. You wouldn't believe that a trunk would be able to do that just so cleverly. And in the case of feeding the animals, unfortunately you have heard the elephants are quite destructive, but what this elephant has done, she's actually broken off the branch to bring down the speckworm. That's the succulent plant life on the tree for her baby to eat. So it's nice. But it was also nice being in Addo because you can really get up close, as you saw, very close 
at the water holes or driving along the road. And this, the, the elephant that we're walking on, is the road. So here we are facing the elephants, and there is a tour bus coming along behind. And you can see the elephants are totally unconcerned, no problem at all, quite happy. And as long as you don't encroach on them, as long as you respect them, they are more than happy to graze and they'll walk around you. But unfortunately, we have to leave Addo if we want to go any further. And we're going to go along, toward, along the garden route, but I'm not showing you any pictures of that. It in itself is a whole journey, but just to Cape Town and slightly above to where that green is about the word Cape Town, I have to show you Table the Mountain just to show you where we're going. And then up north, to Bird Island, Bird Island. So it's north of uh, Cape Town, the western coast, and the island is only one of six sites worldwide where Cape Gannets breed. Now the beauty of it, there is one, one of those little islands I know you're for Addo, that is an island where Gannets breed. But in order to get there, you have to fly by helicopter or take a boat or any way of difficulty. Whereas to get to this island, you merely walk across the breakwater. Very, very nice and easy to photograph and to get there. And in rugby field size is three rugby fields. And there we have the Also swift turn. And also cormorants. And here you can see, not ideal for photography, but fantastic for breeding and viewing. Uh, they put up these nesting stands, so there is somewhere for the uh, cormorants to breed. Also at Seal Island or Bird Island, sorry, Bird Island, you get the seals. Lovely to see, but not so nice for this, the cormorants, the gannets. About 15 years ago, the seals decimated the colony. They ate, came onto the land and chased all the birds away, the ones they didn't feed on. And for a while, there were no gannets on the island. And this guy sitting here, one photographer, the guy on my right, as I'm looking at it, he was a researcher and he'd be involved in actually making models of gannets and putting them out on the island. Because the thing is, as birds fly across, if they don't see any other birds there, they're not going to come into land. So they put out these models, plaster, Paris, whatever type they made, all over the island, and slowly the whole colony came back. So a lovely success story. You can photograph very nicely from this side, looking down at the gannets. And across from the breakwater, you can see the gannet colony. The other nice thing about this colony is you can pay for a person. Obviously, uh, you get special privileges and it costs. But what you are allowed to do is go into the colony. Once again, because it's nature, wildlife, you have to be very aware of not disturbing the birds. And when I say go into the colony, I don't mean into right in amongst the birds, but here at the edge of where the birds are. So that you can go and you sit and just get yourself prepared to see what happens. Sometimes you can actually be in the way and you have to get out of the way pretty as they run towards you to take off. Again, you need a zoom lens because they'll fly from a distance, come straight over the top of you, and you want to be able to choose what you include and what you don't. Gannets mate for life, and amazingly, as it may seem to us, they know exactly which their mate is. They all may look alike, 
but that can exactly to its weight and land in it amongst the whole um, colony right exactly where it's meant to be. I did take my long lens as well because to get close up shots, you can't be as close to the gun as you'd like to be. So this is on a 600 bill, being able to go in close and then compose whatever you want. You've got all sorts of options. And as I say, provided you don't disturb the birds, you don't have to sit down all the time. You can walk, but on the periphery of the colony, not within it and not to disturb them. And then you get the opportunity to photograph all sorts of behavior. And like with any wildlife, you need to know what you're doing and know when the best time is to be there. If you go, say, May or June, you might not even see any gannets because what they do is they fly out and they stay out. They uh, roost on the sea, in the sea. Uh, they don't come back. And they only come back for breeding. Breeding starts with the breeding cycle, usually about August, September, October. Uh, chicks are born anytime onwards. And then up until about April, you are able to photograph the chicks and the fledglings. But now, obviously, Cape Town is a long way from me, so I can't go there every day. So you have to choose when you want to be there. And once again, with the 600 mil lens, uh, you can go in close. These ugly little chicks just haven't been born. As they grow up, they are black. And to start off, the parents are feeding them all the time. Both parents will feed them. But by the time they get this size, they start trying out, seeing if they can fly. Once they know they can fly, they actually have to be very well fed because then they leave the island and the fishing is not just there at the island. They have to go out and fish. And the researchers reckon they need to have enough food in them to last them at least 10 days because they might go as long as that without food. So unless I catch a boat, I'm going to leave the gannet colony now because they're all ready to fly and go off and they'll come back next year. We're going to fly too, except we're going to drive but up to this little green patch here. And if you see, part of it is in South Africa and part of it is in Botswana. And it's actually the first transfrontier park but the interesting thing is, it was established in 1931 to protect the migrating game, especially the hemp book, which you might know as oryx. These are pictured here, and that's called the Kalahari hemp book park. Kalahari, because that was the desert, and the animal. And in 1948, an informal verbal agreement was made between, you see there, the Betuana and Protectorate and the Union of South Africa to set up a con conservation area in the two areas of the land, to land. 51 years later, it was finally formally signed, whereby both undertook to manage their adjacent national parks, which was the Henfuk National Park in Botswana, and the Kalahari came in South Africa as one single unit. So, in fact, they've been doing it for 51 years until they only, in 2000, was it formally launched as the first peace park. And it was named the Kalahari Transfrontier Park. Now, this picture is important because of this white thing here. Now, I think. I don't actually have a picture of it because who would want to photograph a white sign post? Uh, that was actually the dividing line between 
the two countries. That was the only border. The animals right from 50 years prior to this were able to move freely between the two. And in fact, the roads, uh, you drive on roads and they also went freely between the two. So a long time coming, but it is our first peace park. And one of the well-known creatures in the Kalahari are the lions. And something not so well-known is that their stable diet is actually porcupine. But the porcupine are nocturnal creatures generally. And so you don't very often see them trying to attack a porcupine. This is a young lion. You can see that because he's still got spots on his body. And he hasn't got a big mane, he's got a, a little bit of a mane. And apparently he had been, well, the family had been trying since 10 o'clock the previous night to catch a porcupine. The researchers go out at night and they came back and they told us when we, when, only when we got back because they had no idea that these poor porcupine would have been kept away from the burrow, being tried to be uh, attacked by the lions, and the lions were not succeeding. Now, two things. One, the porcupine does not shoot its quills up, so the only way the lion would get quills in would be to actually uh, go too close, and then they would stick in, and then when he moved away, it would stay in the lion. And the second thing is, the reason the young lions, other than being inexperienced, couldn't actually kill the porcupine, were because mother and baby were able to stand head to head, and instead of just having a vulnerable head for the lions to attack, they had a whole ball of quills, and the lions just couldn't get in. So there you see the two of them trying their utmost to get in, and that's what the lion had to contend with. So, no, those youngsters didn't manage to get the porcupine, and the porcupines managed after a few hours to get away and see another day. This is a different lion, obviously, because of the black mane, an older one, and he has met up with a porcupine and got some of the quills into his face. He has to have either get pull them out himself or have a fellow lion pull them out for him because if they stay in, they can fester and cause him problems. I had to include this one because that to me is the most beautiful looking lion with such a long mane. The hair looks like he's just been to have his hair done. The Kalahari is a desert, very desolate place and dusty. Sandstorm and there the big lion is just sitting there waiting for the storm for the dust to part. Of course, dust can make for very exciting photographs. Uh, when dust from the animals or the storm goes past it, sunset or sunrise, then you have got the opportunity to take some wonderful photographs. Or in this case, sunset, what's happening here is the Srinagar came over the dune and were running towards the waterhole. And so all running dust and a lovely sight to see. This is an interesting picture because I keep on wondering to myself, why is that animal track at that funny sort of zigzag line? I have no idea why, but it makes for an interesting story that he doesn't just take a straight uh, path down the valley. He's actually going to zigzag, and that is just an animal track, and the animals will all follow it. Just to show you the total desolation of the dry, hot place that is the desert. And yet these animals do survive and do thrive. It's 
in the Kalahari or Kalahari, uh, you stay in camps, rest camps, and the squirrels of various animals do come into camp, which means that you can sit down on the ground and let them come up to you and photograph them nice and close up. Once you're actually in the park, you have to stay in your vehicle. You may not get out. Far too dangerous as well. Because he might be just lurking around the corner. Uh, the Kalahari is the land of red sand dunes. And if you get a male lion on him, he looks great. So that is what the Kalahari might look like when it's totally dry on the dunes. And this is a beautiful tree full of social weavers' nests. All those nests have lots of little birds in them. But beneath the tree, you can see how desolate the desert can be until the rains come. So that funny-shaped nest on, or funny-shaped tree is actually a nest there. And in the summer, it gets hot and the rains threaten and finally do come. And this is a kokhalmanda and a gama. And the story old wives tell, which is absolutely true, says if you see them up high in the little twigs in the branches, that it is going to rain. So the moment you see them, you know the rain is coming. And there is the rain. One of my favorite shots, and a lucky shot for me, taken at the first wildlife convention in uh, Kalahari, and a friend was sitting next to me at the seat by the window, and we came across the scene. So I stood up and shot over the top of her, so I was shooting slightly down. My picture, made, my angle meant that I didn't get that bright light of the water right behind the uh, swing box, whereas she is sitting down in the better seat, got a lovely photograph, but ruined for me anyway by the light right through the horns and the bodies of the spring box. And that's what happens after the rain. The birds are amazing. They just, I mean, there were no birds there. And a few weeks later, when it's all green and they know they're going to be insects, they flock in in their thousands. These are abdomen's stalks. And then you'll get puddles. You wouldn't believe it's the same place, but water just congregates and the animals are in seventh heaven. At the actual water holes, you'll see it'll stay quite dry and you see the green in the background. Here we have a mother ostrich with a little baby underneath her. And then on the right, that funny thing is a male ostrich. You see, he has the black feathers and he is dusting himself. So it's sort of quite an intriguing shot. The little guy is sort of saying, what are you doing, Dad? And there he is again with the whole flock of youngsters and decided it was time to go. As long as you sit there and let them keep on doing what they want to do, you're going to get them finally deciding it's time to get up and run. Now, the little ground squirrel, instead of having just absolute dry, he loves to, to eat the flowers and like everything else, taking advantage of the beautiful foliage after the rain. If the rain continues, you start to get flowers like the previous one and lots and lots of flowers. So here, rain is continuing for a few weeks. These are soggy, wet uh, springbok. And those, the white at the back of them are called their prongs, which they put up there when they jump, but they also are just drying it out and protecting themselves. And so it makes quite an interesting photograph. And now we have lovely grass growing, warm light, beautiful moment in time, mum and her baby cheetah. 
Khalkhari is well known for its cheetah, lions, leopards, uh, all the cats, and all the babies. So whether it's a cat or in this case a surrogate, they are, just because it's a beautiful time, lots of babies are around. Or a leopard sleeping in the tree. Leopards are very elusive creatures, but if you are lucky enough to see them, there this guy was right in the tree, and the reason we saw him was because the other cars had stopped and seen him as well. This one, though, was right on the side of the road, no other cars, and we almost drove past. Because when you're looking for animals, you tend to look across the valley, into the dunes, further away, never imagining that not six foot away would be this beautiful leopard. And he was quite happy to sit there, perform for us, wait for our friends to arrive. He just was totally happy in the sun and had no problems at all. You also get Caracal. So this is a portrait which I have uh, played with. It's not a real, it's a real animal, but the background I put in myself to make it more like an art picture than just a photograph. And the African wild cat looks very much like your domestic cat, but isn't quite the same. And he is hanging around the jackal because the jackal and he will compete for the same type of food. One might steal from the other. So they are wary of each other, uh, keep out of each other's way. And as you can see, haggles are raised as they uh, see whether they should attempt to take the other one's food. When the grass is high, now green has gone to yellow, has dried out, but this is how high it can grow. Those are springbok. They're not sitting down, they're actually all running. And you can see the grass is way, way over some of their heads. One of my favorite stories, but very, very sad. You saw this mother with two cheetah cubs, the previous day, and she was on a kill. And she was eating and her babies were having fun and along came a lioness. And the lioness wanted the food, fine. So mum was about to go when the lioness picked up one of her cubs and walked off with it. Killed the cub, dropped it not 50 meters off and poor mum. So it was wonderful to see Mother and cub, and he'll say, Lioness was totally far gone, but at least there was one cub left. But you can't hate the animals for killing each other, and uh, that's life, that's what they do. And so they're beautiful anyway, whether they're lions that have just been there and killed another one, or the beautiful little guy in the grass here. And here, mum is not strangling her cub. She's actually going to pick it up to carry it. And they do move long distances, and they need to be able to, the little cubs can't uh, walk that fast or that far, so mum will carry them, and she'll take it in turns. So now we have to get them carried further because we're going to skip country again. And here, which I showed you, was South Africa, that old sum. That was Kharakari, and that's Botswana side. But we're going to exit through here and go up to Itosha National Park. Itosha Pan National Park, actually. And it used to be German Southwest Africa. That's what Namibia used to be called. And the park was actually proclaimed in 1907, a long time before those in South Africa that I've shown you. And at the time, it covered over 100,000 kilometers. So it was enormous. 
but not like our ones that have got bigger. This has got smaller, and it's reduced after much controversy down to 20,000 kilometers square in 1970. Still a very large area. And the pan, the dry salt pan, which was created when tectonic changes happened and the water that was coming in, uh, the rivers no longer came in, and we ended up with a pan, which is dry most of the time. And it takes up 25% of the park. But not always dry. This is a photograph taken of the flamingo in, in the rain. Because when the pan fills up, the flamingos come in their thousands. The pan only fills up about 10 centimeters. But they come and they drink. And what they also do is they breed. Unfortunately, because the pan is so large and the roads drive around the pan, not through it, obviously, because you couldn't, uh, it is seldom that you see the breeding actually happen, other than maybe through the binoculars if you're lucky. But what is quite amazing is the flamingo come to Etosha when the rain falls, so January, February is a good time, but in all the 20, 30 years that I've been going, the only time, only once have we had so many flamingos. So it's not going to guarantee every year, or even if it does happen once again, you're a long way away. You can't guarantee that it'll happen on the 1st of February or any special day. It's just the luck of the draw. But now, once the flamingos have fledged, they, the youngsters fly to Vulfur's Bay, not the adults. The adults come later. The youngsters know that they have to go to Vulfur's Bay. There you see on the insert, and they fly through instinct to learn. 500 kilometers, 310 miles to get back to Vulfur's Bay. Quite amazing what animals and birds can do. So here we are on the pan. Uh, oh, Try to say the edge of the pan. Giraffe all standing there, storm in the offing. And so you know you're going to get the rain and it's going to maybe fill up a pan, maybe just a little bit. And there it had a bit of rain, so that's what you're likely to get. Small puddles, slightly larger, just natural water falling into the pan. Being a salt pan, it is white. Now, this bit of water that the elephant is drinking from is not natural rainwater. It is actually a spring that uh, is a natural spring occurring. And the elephant can't really spray as far as the lines, but it looks like he's telling them to bush off. And that's a white elephant, not a subspecies, not something different, but a very muddy elephant. And that's why it's white, because the elephant, uh, the mud ground is white. And so you'll get different colors wherever the elephants come from. And that is unfortunately the downside to going during the summer months. It rains. And yes, when the rain stops and the sun comes out, it's beautiful. But you can have booked to go for two weeks and have two weeks of miserable gray weather, which is not great for photography. But when the rainbow comes out, all is forgiven and you go madly shooting. And of course, then you get the elephants and the animals all coming in. They don't come as often to just say one water hole because there are pockets of rainwater all around. But it is wonderful to just watch them wherever they are. Breeding time, obviously, when the going is good and there's lots of food and lots of grass, then that's when the lambs are dropped. And here this is a little springbok hiding in the grass, pretty newly born.
a wildebeest, a blue wildebeest, also a youngster. They're amazing the way they drop the youngster and within, I think the one time we photographed it, we counted, within five minutes of the baby being dropped, it was able to walk. Which is important because otherwise all the predators are going to come and try and catch it, which is quite easy when they're so young. And then the flowers and the beautiful lion, just sitting in the flowers, looking quite content. Once again, youngsters running through the flowers or coming down to water here again. The waterhole, the reason for no greenery right up there is because so many animals will come and they'll walk. And so therefore the greenery will start further away from the actual water. Long lens so that you can go in close and choose the way to compose your photograph. Just makes it interesting to put it all, I call this one stripes, just a little guy in amongst all the stripes. And mum and a youngster in the flowers. As ugly as they are, they're absolutely precious the way these little warthog babies are running through the flowers. But now that is a total contrast to show you the same place in Tasha, but during the dry season when there are no flowers. They still find enough to eat, but having converted it to black and white to emphasize the actual desolation of the whiteness of the whole area. In the background, that is a mirage effect, just a dry pan, and those are actually more animals just coming in. You can see how dry all the surroundings, and you wonder what the animals can eat. Makes beautiful scenes, just the pan and the zebra with this wonderful mirage effect behind. And here I convert it again to black and white because just the amount of dust the elephant are kicking up and it just makes for a nice scenic picture. There are water holes that are permanent in the park that aren't reliant on rain. There are springs and underground water. And if there hasn't been rain, the animals will all come down to the water hole. Here you can see the herd coming down, the one with his trunk up, testing to see what's going on. Because, of course, it's not just the elephants, it's all the animals that come down to drink. And rather like the other scene, the little youngsters get involved and run around and make for interesting photographs. I particularly like this one because I love the dust and the elephants behind that just add to the picture tell more of a story. But there's the, uh, the scene now, that little youngster, he's come down, he's not quite sure where he should be, but he is amazingly brave, and they'll come down. And if you look at this picture, you will see that, okay, not the little youngster, but the others all have tusks. As I said, Addo don't, Itosha do, but they are shorter tusks than maybe the ones you think of, of the great big tuskers. And the elephants will swim, and the other animals will come down, but they'll be wary. They'll check out what's going on. And you can see we've got impala, zebra, and there's even a kudu in the background. Now, the important thing about the impala, the one on the left is the black-faced impala. Uh, only get it in Etosha, as opposed to the normal impala with the oxpecker. And that photograph isn't actually from Etosha, but I put it in because I just wanted to show you the difference with the black stripe along the face. The impala have this beautiful rocking horse action when they run, so they make for nice action photographs. Different to the springbok who pronk, and different to the kudu who leap 
And did you notice underneath the kudu's beach, there's a jackal sitting. Just gives a nice sense of scale. Not only do the elephant keep animals away, so too do the lions. Here, these youngsters, and there are youngsters again. You can see they don't have big, heavy manes, but they're all males, and they're sitting there drinking and keeping the other animals away. For how long? Well, it depends how desperate the other animals are. Obviously, this elephant decided the lions weren't going to trouble him, so he could come in quite happily and have a drink. And there the, is the lioness, no uh, man. But interesting how, obviously, she's not quite as close as it looks, but they are concerned. They can see from her stance, the way she's walking, that she's not actually hunting. So they're not worried. They'll be alert, they'll watch her, but they won't all do a mad panic rush away. This one did do a mad panic rush, because it came down from the opposite direction, started drinking, and then looked up. Looked up straight at those lines and did an immediate right and turn, turn about, and came almost straight on at us because we were sitting in the car photographing the action, and this poor zebra didn't know where to go. <coughs> There's a young lion, was quite, quite intent on the eland, but not so intent because it's a pretty big eland and he'd have to be pretty strong to bring him down. But I do think lions are sometimes quite stupid because these youngsters spend ages chasing the giraffe backwards and forwards uh, you wouldn't think they ever catch a giraffe. I mean, where do they get hold of to actually take it down? Uh, I haven't seen it happen, but apparently the most times that they catch a giraffe is when it's running across a tar road because there are tar roads around and then the giraffe slips and immediately the lion can jump on them. Giraffes are fun for interesting angles, just shooting low, and that hen's uh, book looks like it's going to run right through its legs. All the little teals swimming in with the reflection. Once there's water there, it's quite fun, all sorts of pictures you can take. And of course, the elephant is having a fun. And I enjoy this because the giraffe are watching what's going on, and the elephant is obviously saying, eh, I'm happy, and it's my bath, steer clear of me. So all sorts come to the water, springbok, zebra, giraffe, elephant, and birds. Sometimes the birds flock so much that they actually obliterate the animal. In the background, that's an elephant. These are red-billed quilia and they fly together in enormous flocks. That's a picture of a, a bunch of them, uh, and all the trees around will have them, then suddenly they'll take all take off together and make a beautiful pattern. And in the background, I'm not sure if you've got the stop sharing sign in front of the picture. I don't want to move it because the last time I did is when it froze. But behind that flock are two giraffes. Photography is all about enjoying uh, the action, the story, appreciating what's going on, and looking for something that makes an artistic interpretation. I said before, I like to shoot on a zoom lens, which allows you to de-zoom and get the whole lot, or go in close and get just the one animal. And water reflections. Uh, once it's water around, the animals are going to come in, and it's just a matter of being patient and sitting there and enjoying it. 
talking about sitting there and enjoying it, this is now a pond with only one little something for the uh, turtles, terrapins to sit on. And so the one guy, they're not two different makes because one's pale and one's dark. This guy has been there a while. He climbed onto what looks like elephant dung. He climbed there, dried out, and now another one has come and climbed on top. Not intending to mate, purely because he also wants to come out and sun himself. Just a cute little dab chick looking at something to eat and the reflection makes for an interesting picture. So whether it's a small little bird or big animals, there's always something going on at the water. And we tend to go and sit at water holes and wait for the action to happen rather than driving around madly looking for something that you may or may not see. You know the animals need to come down to drink and that's what they do. Hopefully sooner rather than later, but your patience is generally rewarded. When the animals come down to drink, so they sometimes, as I said before, the lions kept away from water and the zebra will have mock fights or get very serious if the stallions are around and they are wanting to claim their rights, the right main stallion of the herd. So you get lots of action going on in the background and even horrid action such as here, when I say horrid, because now the stallion was chasing the mare and her little baby got caught up in the heart, the caught up, knocked over and bitten. And a little baby ran into the water to get away from the mean guy. You can actually see on this one, there is that red, red, that's blood. So the stallion actually bit the poor little guy. The beauty of digital is that the next day we photographed uh, the uh, uh, zebra again in a similar area. We didn't recognize it then, but when we got home, we realized that this little baby was still there the next day. So all the cuts and injuries that it had were healing up nicely. And the reason we could identify it is that no two zebras have the same stripes. Each and every one is individual and different. So that is a lovely little story. Here we have a rhino. Now, do you know whether that is a black rhino or a white rhino? Looks to me like a gray rhino. So where they came up with the names, I really don't know. This is a black rhino, and the better name for it is actually a hook-lipped rhino. You can see that it has this rounded lip and the lips are actually to assist it with eating. It uh, eats, as you can see, all sorts but from the branches up in the trees and takes um, the greenery there. So that's the shape of its uh, lip. And so therefore, a hook lip rhino is a much better name than a black rhino. There you can see its face and the shape quite nicely. And there is the other, that's the white rider, a very brown one actually. But rather like I told you with the white elephant, it depends on their surrounds and the dust around that will make them more one color or the other. But you can see this is a square lip rhino. The lip is square and what these rhinos do, they actually don't browse on trees they graze on the ground. Our rhino are very precious to us. And if I can leave you with one thing tonight, is to say, please take care of our rhino. They deserve their place on the planet. Thank you very much. Well, that was a spectacular presentation and spectacular journey.
<laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure. I enjoy sharing the most beautiful place on earth. That that uh, we would we would like to know how do you get into it for the first place? I mean, how do you got into wildlife photography? Sorry, can you repeat the question? What inspired you to become a wildlife photographer? The wildlife. I mean, it's so beautiful you can't not fall in love with the wild animals. That's definitely i mean it's a it's a fabulous journey there amazing is, photographs no yeah. absolutely no yeah it's no words literally taking us to that place how how does this animal survive you see that huge difference in the uh, terrain. When, terrain when it after a rain and before the rain it's 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 such a difference Yes, totally amazing. I mean, that's a desert. And uh, it's immediate. When I say immediate, you know, a few days and you've already got the first shoots of grass. Uh, everything has to grow very quickly after rain. And it can yeah. go for a long time without rain. We, we'll add a bus to the team. <clears throat> Jill, which was the picture that gave you the best South African award in wildlife? I remember you said you got a uh, Toyota Land Cruiser for it or something? Uh, yes, that's right, I did. And which picture was that? Did you show it to us today? Um, it was actually a panel of photographs. No, I haven't shared that with you today because it was a panel of photographs or 12 photographs and they were from all over the world. So there was Antarctica to Africa to America to all over. So no, you didn't get that panel. But if you go onto my website, which is not updated, but the panel is on my website. I'll do that. Thank you. Lovely presentation. Very nice pictures, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from our audience. Uh, what are the basic rules for shooting in South African parks or reserves? He's trying to compare it with Kenya. Okay. In South African parks, you may not ride off the road. You have got to stay on the road. Uh, not at all. You've got to go come eat. Uh, Sunrise to sunset, generally, you have to go, can only go out, you've got to be back at your camp. So those are the important things. And then with, wherever you are, whether you're Kenya, South Africa, you have to respect the animals. And it's the animals are, no photograph is worth hurting an animal or disturbing an animal. Okay. What, what are, are the set of, equipments you use and in um, what's the range you require in South Africa when it comes to lens? Okay, somewhere like the Khalakhadi, I do have a 6600, which I will shoot with a 1.4 converter. Uh, and as much as people love full frame cameras, I actually have a full frame and a 1.3 crop factor. And let me tell you that when you're in a place like the Khalakhari where sometimes action is a long way away you are very happy to have that extra crop factor to bring you closer so yes a long lens is very useful but as I say, in Addo for instance not necessary um in Itasha even I always shoot with two or three bodies with two or three lenses ready so you can change and pick up and don't have to change lenses. So you pick up what you need. And if you have the variety, it's worth it. But of course, it's traveling. To travel with a 600 lens is very heavy and not all that user-friendly. Um, my Nikon, I've got a 200 to 400. I love that lens, very versatile. And you put it on the uh, one with the crop factor and you can get 
you know, pretty, you know, you've got a good focal length. And then, of course, you need the wide angle because there's always, I love wide angle because a picture is more than just a picture of an animal, it's the whole scene as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what is the elephant population now in Addo? Um, I'm subject to correction, but it's about 600. But it, it could be even more because they're breeding wonderfully. They took uh, took advantage of the lockdown and seemed to do some wonderful breeding because when we went there, suddenly there were a whole lot more babies. Well, that's great. That's great. Well, I mean, it, 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 your presentation covered almost every question. It's like, what is the season and each season, what you can expect and what kind of pictures you can expect. Yeah, throughout the year, you, you have taken yeah. us. Taken us, so that's that's awesome. And, and one one last question from the audience is, which Nikon uh, camera do you use? Nothing fancy. I sold my D4 because it's too heavy. I now just use a D750 and a D500. Okay. Um, the cameras today are so fantastic that you don't need the biggest and the best is yeah. how you see. That's that's completely, that's the point, you know, to everybody who always asks for the higher range or whatever, you know, what's the camera, it's, it's definitely the person behind the camera and definitely the way you want to show the world what you see. Uh, Nisha. Yeah. <coughs> we, <coughs> excuse me. We in Dubai have only been talking about Tanzania and Kenya. Yes. Uh, let me tell the viewers here that yeah. I had the opportunity and I was thrilled that uh, I visited the Edo National Park with Jill. Uh, Tasneem was there also. And we were there for about three nights. Uh, the infrastructure of the park is wonderful. Uh, you've got all the facilities over there. Uh, you can stay over there if you book the room a couple of days or months earlier, and the sighting is beautiful. So if you want to go in for the elephants, then uh, not only the Embolisi Park, but also the Edo National Park would be equally in uh, uh, rank for us photographers. That's, that's, right, that's, that's a great information. Yes. <clears throat> And what others didn't tell you is that a photograph he took last year, the last year, the year before, last year, this in year, Addo has it was last has, evening. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, but Nisha, yeah. They, they say behind every successful man, there's a woman. I had two women with me, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and the photograph got an award, you see. But Jill, behind the setting was right. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. It was a silver uh, in PSA International this year for me. That's great. That's great. Well done. Very good. So, once again, thank you. Thank you so much for your time and the spectacular set of imagery and the journey with with every bit of details. And you know, it it was it was amazing. We beautiful did. storytelling session. Yes. yes. Every image yeah, got a story. And, uh, Thank Jill you. also has the distinctions of PSA. Anyone who wants to go in for the distinctions of the gold, the silver and the bronze, which we people or photographers, uh, colleagues, a lot of us go in for in Dubai. Uh, let me inform our colleagues here that Jill <laughs> is the director of PSA distinctions. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we so that's you know, good. Who's heading at the at the top? You know, go in with your wildlife and then then get uh, what you call grilled very well done. Yeah. <laughs> we, we'll do that. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, someone was asking if you you are active in Instagram. Someone was asking for the or any social media. Any social media. I think in a Facebook, I know, then Instagram. I I I don't see any post from your side. I have seen your account, but. I haven't seen any post from your no, side. 
I'm sorry, I don't. I, you can find me on Facebook, but not on Instagram. And my Facebook is not very active. But occasionally I put this on the app. Okay, so in case if somebody wants to see your latest update, is it's your it's website or? Best ways to find me is on Facebook. Okay, great. And one last question: because Do you have an, yes. do you have an animal that is your favorite? That's I change. <laughs> I change. One moment it's an elephant because I love him so much, and then I love a cheetah, and then I go back to elephants. Then I think a leopard. <laughs> so probably <laughs> elephants, but maybe cheetah. Oh. <laughs> that was a question from Chris Logan. Chris Logan, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of thanks not from a bunch yeah. of people. So on that note, you know, thank you, Jill. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you, Abbas, here as well. Thank yeah. you all. Thank you all. That was great. Thanks a lot. Have a yes, good day. Thank you very you much. Too. Thank you. Or just seeing you again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So that was uh, Jill and her spectacular, spectacular. That, oh my God! That rhino picture that coming towards you is still in my eye, in front of my eyes. And and every bit of the detail yes. on, on the weather, on the on the terrain, on the species, and every every bit, every bit was like so informative. And there there is no need to ask any questions, any further question. Everything was explained so well. A lot of pictures that we feel like uh, it doesn't have value when we take, like seeing her pictures, there are like plenty of images. Yeah. You see a lot more opportunity. We opportunity to make pictures. Opportunities we missed. Uh, yes. Yeah. So even even the uh, small, small animals that we all ignore. Ignore. She has captured it very beautifully. So it's it's actually mm -hmm. a lesson for everyone not to miss any species in nature. Yes. You can create wonderful fr frames with every each and every species. Yes. That was that was an amazing, amazing yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. So what's in store for tomorrow, Hermi? On that uh, note? Tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, what's the next session? It's on Wednesday, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Peter is coming up with a conservation story. Okay. Some scientific sign from a scientific point, he is talking. Uh, he's he's talking about the bears, spirit bears. Yeah, spirit bears. Yeah. So, so that will be another learning session for us as well. Yes. Let's and, catch yeah. up. On that note, it's time once again. It's uh, COVID. Time to say bye. <laughs> yeah, time to say bye, and it's COVID, and let's uh, hope to see you all on Wednesday, same time. And be safe. Take care. Use your mask. You know, sanitizers and uh, social yeah. distancing. Stay safe. Thank you and so thank much. You, thank for you watching. so much for watching us, and please do subscribe and share your words because the whole thing is all about sharing. Uh, Sharing and reaching it to maximum people. People. Thank. Bye. Thank you on that note. Bye.